taking responsibility, a duty which we owe to others. The College of Europe is honored to be able to welcome you, Mr. President. Thank you for being with us here today. And now I invite Rector Mogherini, who is joining us online from Bruges, to take the floor. Dear Federica, please. Thank you very much, dear Eva, dear students, uh, colleagues, Mr. President. It is uh, first and foremost a big thank you that I would like to send you from Bruges, uh, where we are uh, watching uh, together with you, uh, with uh, two, some 250 students in the auditoria and some 40 junior diplomats, uh, uh, this important event. I would like first and foremost to uh, thank the Ukrainian uh, and Lithuanian students uh, across campuses, but mainly in Atalim, but also across campuses that have organized this day and especially for having organized this cross-campus. I think this is an excellent initiative and uh, I want to congratulate you with you on this. I want to thank uh, the President. Uh, that is a pleasure to see again. Uh, tell him how honored we are to host him in our college for what I believe is going to be an historic day for the College of Europe. Mr. President, uh, the thanks goes not only for your presence with us today, for the words you want to share with us and with our students, most of all today, but uh, first and foremost uh, for what you're doing for your country, for your people, for Europe, and for the rest of the world. To defend freedom, democracy, rules-based international order that seems collapsing every single day a little bit more in Ukraine due to the Russian aggression and war. We stand with you. We are, as a college, proud to have a vibrant, excellent Ukrainian community with our students, staff, faculty, that we try to sustain and protect and accompany in these difficult months. And we will do everything that we can to stand by your side in any possible way. Thank you very much. And uh, we are all looking forward to hearing your words today. Thank you for these words of greetings. Um, indeed, um, the Ukrainian Lithuanian National Day here at the College of Europe in Natalin is a powerful reminder of the significance of unity and solidarity within our European family in this historical moment. Now, it is my huge honor to give the floor to our distinguished guest, the President of Ukraine, Mr. Volodymyr Zelensky. On the establishment of this educational institution, our capital. I would like to thank you for the good words about Ukraine about Ukrainians. I would like to thank you. I would like to thank Eva and Federica. I would like to thank you, students. Thank you for your support for our struggle as we're fighting for freedom of Europe. And every one of us uh, does um, his or her duty. And we are all sincerely fighting for Europe. And this is an important battle for our generations. We're fighting for Europe so that uh, indeed we will have Europe of common shared values where we shall enjoy true equality and diversity across the entire continent so that uh, Europe enjoys peace. This is our battle, yours and ours, and we ought to be victorious in this battle for Europe. We should not forget that uh, Europe has seen many different times and has experienced different systems that were fighting for power in Europe and around the world. And I think that we, it is important 
for us to remember it as today we are commemorating the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of the Holocaust. We need to remember that once we see more and more news coming about the brutality of the Russian war against Ukraine as we hear about the Russian tyranny against freedom in the territory that is controlled by the Kremlin. And it is not only about Ukraine, it's not only about our region, it's not only about um, territories that the Kremlin would like to take over. It's all about Europe. It's about our shared space. We, this is the space of freedom, democracy, rights, so the observance of human rights and social justice. And these values are not uh, given out of the blue. It's not that something could be treated as something obvious that is passed from generation to generation by institutions. One has got to be ready to fight for those and has to be determined to fight for them, to have uh, leaders to do that. Unfortunately, it is in our human nature to relax, to lose what we have gained or to move towards uh, brutality and different totalitarian systems uh, had their roots here in Europe. But this is the war that is being aged here in Europe. And now the genocidal policy is being exercised by Russia here in Europe. But also here in Europe, we have one of the most powerful sources of global freedom and of international rule of law. This is the source that has been secured by the previous generations. The European Union, the European institutions, they are there to protect freedoms, the, right, the rule of law and human rights and humanity. Can such institutions remain just because they exist? No. Just like a country cannot stay on its own without an army. Just like here in Europe, we will not do it on our own. We need protection. And that is why I'm addressing the students of the College of Europe. I address you to be not only a part of Euro European bureaucracy. It's important to be not only people savvy in, on European affairs, but it is important to be the defendants, men and women defending, protecting European values. And you're learning here to become leaders in fighting for European values, how to be those commanders who will be able of leading people in their fight, in your fight for Europe. And even once we defeat Russia on the battlefield and when uh, finally, Europe may enjoy peace. We will still have to be ready, to be vigilant, to be ready to fight for rights and freedoms in Europe. Tyrannies always find a way to surface. That is why freedom shall always need those who shall protect it. And I do believe that you are the leaders to become. You will guarantee the protection of freedom. And I'm happy to see that uh, the College of Europe in Bruges and in Natalin has students, uh, men and women from Ukraine, from different cities of Ukraine, from Kyiv, from Vinitsa, from Chernivtsi, from Cherkasa, from Mykolaiv, from Kriverich, from Kremenchuk, Sevastopol. And we shall do what it takes so that the Ukrainian presence in the European studies shall be ever increased so that our people will have a possibility of speaking to professionals that Europeans can see Ukrainian specialists on European affairs not only online but also once the graduates of the College of Europe shall start working in state institutions of Ukraine. Once we see them in the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine, once we see them in the diplomatic core of Ukraine, once they start working as representatives of Ukraine around European countries. And I'm sure, I'm confident that they will represent Ukraine with dignity in the EU institutions, including the graduates uh, Ukrainian graduates of the College of Europe. This is the only path 
to victory in our battle for Europe. Just like we have united Europe, just like we're reinforcing Europe, this is exactly the way how we shall guarantee security and freedom to Europe long term. Of course, with Ukraine as a member of the EU, nothing else is possible. Thank you very much for your kind attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions. And I also would like to listen to my great friend, uh, uh, Gitanas, uh, the president of the Republic of Lithuania, who is my close friend, and glory to Ukraine. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Yes, you are absolutely right. Yes, this is a very long path. It has already been very long path and uh, high value path for Ukraine because today Ukraine is fighting and Ukraine is losing the best people in our country. We are fighting for freedoms and rights. We're fighting for our citizens and we're fighting for our shared values, European values. So this is the way which is not only long, unfortunately, it is also bloody. And we have, it is of great value for our country. Eva has said that Ukraine today and Ukrainians today are the face of Europe. And I was very pleased to hear that, I should, uh, I should say. And I really like this very profound understanding of the processes that are taking place and these sufferings. But we're suffering for our independence and for Europe. And we understand this. We're fully cognizant of this. So how can we end this war quicker? This is where we need united aid from the entire world and undoubtedly we need uh, the support of Europe and of the European Union because the, we need to end this war quickly and to save the country so as to save this very face of this country, to save the faces of these people who are fighting for their freedom but they're also fighting for freedom of Europe and this is the task number one. And as for the candidacy what can you do so as to support us? Please exert pressure on the authorities in your countries so as to support Ukraine on her part to full membership in the EU so that Ukrainians do not lose this great motivation because to be part of the European Union is a great source of motivation for us. We are fighting for our homes, children, people, but we are also fighting for our future in the European Union. And that is why, by supporting us, you will accelerate our movements towards to the EU. And I'm sure we can do it. I'll be open and frank. I always expect weapons um, to be delivered to Ukraine at all summits. However, there are uh, different uh, types of weapons. It's not only about ammunition. Also, we need sanctions. Sanctions are a very important form of weaponry. There, is, there are economic weapons, political weapons. They are also important. Thank you for your question. Peace, calm, having peaceful skies, having safe and secure streets, having security in the territory of our country, the deoccupation of all our territories, and the deoccupation of all territories of Ukraine. And this shall give us this status, the status when Ukraine will be safe. I think that victory, victory is then when the war is over. Even the status, bef the status before the 24th of February, that is uh, 
uh, when the full-scale Russian war started. The, the condition before that was not, also, it was not peace. It was not victory as well. Because there, in the east of Ukraine, of our country, there were shots fired because parts of the, uh, of the Donbass and the Crimea were occupied. There is never peace when the Russian Federation is in the part of your territory. And therefore, we need to provide for the deoccupation of the entire territory. And we need the global guarantees and respect of our sovereignty. Uh, also, we needed uh, the observance of the Charter of the United Nations, uh, and this is what victory means. You know, thank you for this question, Otto. I think that that um, the war is um, uh, the most important challenge for Ukraine today, and this war has uh, affected many different spheres of life in Ukraine, in Europe, and all over the world. And uh, together with the war, we have a number of internal domestic challenges in Ukraine. But. Uh, we have this very acute sense of these challenges because uh, the war means that we cannot forgive some things that used to be before the war started. Therefore, I think that as far as the priorities are concerned, we need to provide for the de-oligarchization of our society. And um, uh, to provide for that, we need to take some strategic steps. We are on this path. We have really good results on the, as far as uh, the oligarchization is concerned. Also, we need to fight corruption. We have uh, quite a good anti-corruption structure. And we are making headway. And um, we uh, have uh, just um, concluded um, a, um, a procedure for filling the position of the head of the NABU, of the Anti-Corruption Bureau. So next week, we're going to have a new head of this authority. And therefore, all of the anti-corruption institutions in Ukraine are going to work at full steam. And also, we have challenges as far as the judiciary is concerned. So regardless of the war, we did start reforming our judiciary. And we started reforming our law enforcement. And I think that those are the most important challenges. As for the war. The war also shows you the weak spots that used to be in our country. We see, for instance, um, the weak uh, spots in our energy sector. And this is what compelled us to start developing very quickly. I think we are the fastest developing country in that sense in Europe. But it's not because we are the wisest, but simply we had to face the challenge, the challenge of the war. So we're moving forward. We are moving to the, towards the decentralization of our energy sector. And we are greening our energy sector. So as you can see, a lot is happening. and. Also, I would like to mention yet another priority that we started working on before the war. Even um, in the beginning of my presidency, I saw that to be as one of the most tangible capabilities that would help us to fight corruption. We need to provide for the digitalization of all state processes in Ukraine. And today, we have developed digitalization fairly well. And the war has even accelerated those processes even more.
Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. You know that what is most important for students is to gain knowledge. Knowledge is treasure. And uh, after that, once you graduate, you are all too busy. And to gain even more knowledge, you have to work a lot. And there will be many challenges to be faced. Uh, therefore, I think that this is the time when you as a student uh, develop. This is the time to gain knowledge. And one, then you start applying this knowledge in practice. So gain as much knowledge as you can, but then do go and work in Ukrainian institutions and practice your knowledge in Ukrainian institutions. You will be most welcome, and this is how you will help us. But also now, because of the war, again, because of the challenges, we see that, how should I put it? We see that some institutions are not working quickly enough. Uh, I mean, European and international institutions are not working fast enough. They need renewal. They need to be reset. And I think that you, are the young people, people with energy, and you will have a possibility of gaining this knowledge, but thereafter of you will have a possibility to apply this knowledge in practice being cognizant of the current challenges in Ukraine, you see that uh, we have to exchange POWs. So we also see uh, that we have to face the challenge of the forceful deportation of Ukrainian children to the territory of Russia. We uh, see uh, that uh, the Russians uh, have um, destroyed our kindergartens and schools. Uh, our seaports have been blocked. Uh, our grain transport, uh, gra grain, uh, trans uh, transport infrastructure was necessary to stop the wave of hunger, famine that was brought by Russia to the African continent and to Asia. We haven't blocked those ports. But it's but we see that these global institutions were not always universal. And this is what has led to those very difficult challenges. But you will be capable of facing that. Uh, but uh, from what example? Well, thank you. Thank you for your question. All countries that used to be a part of the Soviet Union, or those countries were, uh, were under the influence of the Soviet Union. For instance, Poland that uh, um, had uh, Soviet troops on its ground. They, all those countries understand that the Russian Federation poses a serious threat. And we all knew and we know that 
whenever the Russian Federation has a possibility of winning this war today in Ukraine, they will not stop in Ukraine. They will not curb their ambitions and stop in Ukraine. They will move on and they will move on to other countries. And I'm sure that the Baltic states and Poland and Germany and many, many other countries understand that uh, and Spain to the best if, uh, if uh, and if the translation is uh, correct uh, in Spain is yet another country that has not to take risks thinking uh, that should not risk the thinking that Russia will never reach the borders of Spain. That would be a big geostrategic mistake. However you look at it, Russia has invaded the territory of an independent Ukraine. And today, Ukraine, although we are in a very difficult situation, we are still capable of fighting the Russians back. And that is why it is very important to unite around Ukraine. And that is exactly what the EU is doing. Yes, there are some countries, well, actually, perhaps not countries, but I th I'm sure that all societies in the EU are supporting Ukraine, and they're supporting our uh, army, and they're supporting us with humanitarian aid and with financial aid. I would like to thank all of the European countries, but some leaders, some leaders are still playing politics. I think this is redundant. This is not necessary. They're wasting their time. They're not wasting their time. They're wasting the time of their societies. And this is very risky. Thank you very much. If I were to describe everything in greatest detail, this is how I will reveal all the strategic information to Russia and all that we can do. So I'm not going to give you a full answer because this is one of the modern forms of weaponry. We see that information is a powerful tool and we act faster than Russia, we're quicker than Russia, we always speak the truth. And I think that this is one of the most important advantages, because as far as information space is concerned, we're quicker, we show what is happening, we speak directly to people. And we have been doing so from the very first day of the war. We devote all of our time to maintain contact with people, with societies, uh, with people from different countries. I have uh, had hundreds, maybe thousands of such contacts. And this is very important. It's important to think. It's important to be in constant touch with societies in different countries. We should not forget about those societies. We need to talk to them. Because, of course, they do have their own problems. And uh, I should not think that everyone is always looking at Ukraine. Every country, every society has its own set of problems and challenges. But today, Ukraine is a high priority matter. So let me underscore it yet again. Whatever is happening today in Ukraine later on may have influence on the situation in other countries. And that is why we have to be very exact in what we show and what we talk about. And also, I think that our priority is about open 
open with regard to the mass media. Since the very beginning, we have engaged a very large number of journalists from different countries and from different continents. Since the very first day of the war, we have uh, had approximately 6,000 journalists working in Ukraine. We just opened our doors, let them see everything what's happening, and then journalists do their job really well. Thank you. You have a question which is, which would take weeks and months of discussions. Nonetheless, I think that you would draw better conclusions that I myself would do. How could we do that? Um, well, no country can win against Tenerife if that country is fighting all alone. Most important is unity. That is why we want to be a member of the EU. That is why we support the EU. But also, we support the EU in a philosophical terms, uh, because the EU is uh, an act of uh, unity of countries. And we, Ukrainians, show by our example that as we Ukrainians stand united in Ukraine, we can fight. And also, the EU is standing united with Ukraine. So no single country can win against Tenerife. But once countries are united, they become competitive in principle and on the battlefield. And once united, we can compete against the tyrannies and we can prevail over any tyranny. Wherever the tyranny would be, at whatever continent a tyranny may be, once democracies unite, they will always prevail and will win against any tyranny. I would also like to extend a huge thanks to the administration of the College of Europe in Natolin, the embassies of Ukraine and Lithuania in Poland, and all our friends for making this event possible and their unequable support. Thank you all, both. Thank you, colleagues. <laughs> who, following, who was following us online for being with us tonight. We hope to host you in Natalie soon.